Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 225 of the At Percussion podcast. We are recording on March 25th, releasing on April 16th. And with me today are my co-hosts, Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Carly Vigna. Hi, everyone. And Casey Cangelosi. Holy crap, you got Evelyn Glennie. That's so cool. Way to go. <laughs> I was going to say the podcast has officially peaked. Uh, I don't know if things can get much better than this in our lives. Also with the situation in the world all a bit, you know, any shakier, but this is one of the best days of all of our lives. So I'll really try to be very brief to introduce our guest, but the guest needs no introduction. Um, Dave Evelyn Glennie, a Scottish virtuoso multi-percussionist, the first person in history to successfully create and sustain a full-time career as a solo percussionist. Um, she performs internationally with a wide variety of orchestras and contemporary musicians. If you've not had the chance to see her live yet somehow, you might know her from her rich discography, which now exceeds 30 CDs. Dame Glennie is a double Grammy award winner and BAFTA nominee, all of that on top of her winning over 100 international awards to date. And again, if that were not enough, Dame Glennie has decided to hijack the podcast game and become a podcast host. Um, Dame Glennie, welcome to our podcast. Hello. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Um, will you please tell us uh, about your most recent uh, involvement with the podcast? Tell us about your podcast, please. Well, basically, um, a lot of my work involves communicating with many, many different people from uh, different disciplines. And so I felt that the one thing that we have in connection is um, the idea of listening. And, uh, and so therefore, I was keen to meet other people and to discover what listening means for them. And, and that really opened up the possibility of uh, chatting with people who are from um, the, the kind of landscape of comedy or of um, the academic world or the arts or education or um, charitable organizations, whatever the case may be. And, uh, and it's really interesting, um, you know, how each person has their own specific journey. Um, and often their line of work can be very much in isolation as it can be for us as musicians. Um, but yet what we do is then share that with what we've uh, been working on within the, the four walls of our, our home or something. And we share that with many people. And so we often become a different specimen then. And our listening skills then really change quite dramatically as soon as there's an audience there. So really, it was just sort of delving into um, people's journeys and, and really, I suppose, using uh, listening as the spine of the conversation. Fantastic. Um, I just listened to the episode with Bill Bailey last night, and I thought it was hilarious. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful conversation. Um, ben, you had a question? Yeah, I was sort of a follow-up question to that on your sort of sharing your your journey. Uh, one of my favorite films has been your documentary, Touch the Sound. Um, and I was wondering, could you tell us about Touch the Sound? Was that your idea or were you approached by the documentary crew about making that film? Or what was the story behind that one? Well, with Touch the Sound, I was actually approached if I'd like to participate in the film. And um, at first, I was very, very dubious about it. I didn't really particularly want to do it. Um, because there's been so many documentaries, mainly for television, um, about my own particular journey, and I just felt enough was enough, and it was the same same thing that was always being told. And so for me, you know, I, I just felt this could be a repetition. However, the uh, filmmaker, Thomas Riedelsheimer, he said, no, 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 it's got nothing to do with that. Um, this really is about um, discovering that sound is all around us and how do we connect with that sound. And so he explained that um, he had made other documentaries about visual artists and various people. And so I had a look at those and I was absolutely enraptured by his work and his angle and the honesty of the films. And so immediately I knew that this was someone I wanted to collaborate with. I felt that he would have a very different take to what had gone before. And so it took about two years for the film to be made. Um, we did some of the filming in places whereby I was already playing uh, in order to keep the costs down. 
um, he explained that the most important person in the making of the film was a sound person uh, because the film is about sound. And so when it is shown in various uh, cinemas and so on, the sound system really, really needs to be uh, good. And um, so it was a very, very small crew always. Um, it was uh, there was never a plan B. So, for example, when I collaborated with Fred Frith in the derelict sugar factory in in uh, in Germany, you know, he and I had never met before. And so I said to Thomas, well, you know, what happens if we don't get on, you know, if the chemistry isn't there and uh, then what do we do? And he said, well, I don't know. We just then don't do it. And there was never a plan B for any part of the film. So and I found that really interesting. And, and I think that's Thomas's trait is that he takes things as they are. So there's no kind of um, making something up. There's no uh, doctoring something that isn't any kind of cosmetic work at all. It is what it is. And if it's captured, then great. If it's not, then that's fine, too. So I really appreciated that. And that's the kind of, I suppose, slow moving film that we have. There's no airs and graces. There's nothing like that. It's just as it is. I love that you mentioned for, for Touch the Sound to be displayed right. The speaker system really matters. And it's tricky today in this world of recording. And we're all making podcasts here on the show. And you can pay so much attention to the sound, but I forget the the exact number. But both co most content is consumed out of our phone or small device where there is no speaker equipment. But it it's just you know there's no low frequency at all unless you're using headphones and so on and so forth. So I I, I think that's overlooked so much. <laughs> like what you're what you're playing it through. And you mentioned on your podcast you think something we have in common is we all listen and we have a question actually from brendan caldwell from facebook and i've heard you speak about this topic for, for a long many years now and he asks what's the difference between hearing and listening what is at the heart of true listening mm. well i think we'll probably all be able to answer that question a little bit more because of the the, the situation that we're all experiencing at this moment in time where we are more isolated um, we're having to uh, pay attention to ourselves more internally. And for me, listening basically is something that starts from within and it goes out rather than hearing something from that's external that then we plant in ourselves and we mis mistake that as, as listening. So in order to be a good listener, you have to listen to yourself. It's um, you know, life mask on an aeroplane first before you can help someone else. So if there's not that sort of ability to pay attention and listen to what's going on within yourself, um, there's no way that you can extend um, your body as a huge ear, as it were, to another person and to understand their situation. And, and I think that's really important. And that, that boils down to your playing as well. Um, you know, what is it about you? You know, the mechanics of you, the pace of you, the rhythm of you, your, your natural um, tempo of speaking, your inflection, your dynamics, you know, everything that make you up, you know, that is all transferred through the decisions you make as a player. It transfers through the instruments that you play to create your particular sound. So you can't find your sound by looking at tutor book one, you know, or looking at someone else playing something on the internet. It, it has to, that listening process has to come from you. So we do an awful lot of um, hearing of other things where we mistake that as being listening, um, but actually listening, for me anyway, has to start from within. Um, and I think listening also takes time. It takes patience. It takes, you know, concentration. Um, and I think that in this sort of extraordinary situation that we're finding ourselves now is that we're suddenly finding that all the noise is disappearing. We have less noise, basically, in our lives, just as we have cleaner air because there are less flights flying around. We have less noise as well. And then it's our decision whether we want to 
sort of bring up the volume again by you know immersing ourselves on YouTube or whatever it might be on all of our gadgets in order to, to make sure there's lots of noise around us or whether to use this as an opportunity and think well hold on a second you know what what's my sound world what what is the sound world of of Evelyn or of you or and and so on and I think that's we, we've got such an opportunity here to reconnect I think with a lot of things that perhaps um, we we we've, we've either just put a, a block up or or you know just made a disconnect with so that for me is the difference. I had a sort of follow up question to that it, w hearing you speak and I've never put this together in my own mind just now but. John Cage comes to mind, and it, obviously everyone knows his famous four minutes and 33 seconds, which is four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, and the idea is that you listen to the sounds in the world around you. Uh, and in my research, I was fascinated to find that that wasn't uh, a late idea of John Cage. I think when he was a senior in high school, he was already proposing an international day of silence where we're all just quiet and just listen. I was wondering, Evelyn, are you in, like, was any of this inspired by John Cage? I've never really heard you speak of John Cage, so. Well, I, you know, I'm a, a massive fan of John Cage for many different reasons, because, you know, I think as percussion players, we're curious towards objects um, and we, 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 we kind of easily blur the lines as regards to, um, you know, an instrument and an object. So we can get equal satisfaction from playing a, a high end marimba as we can from playing a, a bunch of leaves outside in our garden, you know, we'll find ways to to make that really interesting. That's just what we do as sound creators. And I think my whole upbringing since I started percussion at the age of 12 was that my teacher regarded us as sound creators first and foremost, and then musicians. So we had to, to have an idea of, of the line of a structure of a beginning, middle and end. Um, and then thirdly, as instrumentalists, so he didn't really care whether we were playing the paper and comb or uh, an accordion or a, a violin or the voice or percussion. So that, that just happened to be a tool. And, and I think that stayed with me, you know, over the years during my whole time, uh, you know, being curious towards, towards sound making. And, and this is vitally important when you write music for um, media purposes. Um, because actually, you know, you can, you might just have one sustain of a particular frequency. It could be, you know, from from a, a, a bowed vibraphone or a, a, a cymbal or a, a crotale or whatever. Now, if you were to stand up in a concert and just only do that, people would probably want their money back. But in relation to how it's used in... Uh, you know, next to a, a picture, next to um, something that absolutely holds that mood or creates an atmosphere. It's unbelievable. So I think I don't really put barriers up. So, you know, sound is sound and there's always placement of sound. And I think every single day of our lives, every single one of us actually performs John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds. Okay, it could be a few seconds that we perform it. But, you know, ultimately, when we you know, get out of our bed in the morning, you know, we may not say anything, nothing might be said at all. We're with our own thoughts. Um, but that, that, you know, we think it's silent, we think, oh, there's no noise happening here. But actually, what is happening? And if we pay attention, we might think that there's an awful lot of chatter going on. And that will have an impact on the action you then make. So, you know, I might get out of bed and I might say to myself, you know, within myself, uh, shall I shower first or shall I have a bath or shall I have breakfast or what shall I do first? So whatever it is, no one cares in the world what order I do these things. But for me, it's a conversation and therefore a sound and it's listening to myself. And that has an impact on how I construct my day um, or make the de decisions I do. Um, so John Cage is, I think, influences us all, whether we're aware of that or not. Some of us might be familiar with his name and, and some people not. And it doesn't matter because we're all performing John Cage. I think these are wonderful things to talk about and think about, especially in these times as we're all reevaluating and suddenly having the time to get to know different parts of ourselves and our routines in, in totally different ways. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this is what I find interesting in, um, you know, sustaining yourself 
as a player, um, you know, you're not the same player when you started, you know, at the age of 12 to when you reach the age of 20 to when you reach the age of 30 and, and 40 and so on and so forth. And, you know, everything is like a, a, a river. It, it will morph in a natural state to something else. Your preferences will change as well. Or how you play something, you know, when you were 20 or so, will definitely have a different flavour to how you play it now. And that's absolutely fine. And that's essential to happen. And I think that's probably why making recordings is, is such a challenge, because you know that it's a frozen moment in time. And, you know, it's, it's a shame if someone says, oh, that's a definitive performance or, oh, that's the one I work towards or whatever, because it, it really is, well, that's what happened on Tuesday at three o'clock, you know, on the 29th of October uh, 2000 or something. And, and you know that you had to come out with something at that point, but as soon as you've recorded it, you, you realize that there are so many different ways that you would have wanted to tackle something. So, um, and I think it's really important that we listen to ourselves as players, um, knowing that it's like peeling an onion, you know, today is today, tomorrow's tomorrow, you know, next day is the next day. And we have the permission to, to make changes, to, to experiment, and that's absolutely essential to our curiosity. That's wonderful. I, I want to invite for students on forging their own paths um, and their own musical careers and finding and developing their own voice, um, especially students when they're transitioning from being in high school and college and then into the professional world? Well, I think it's interesting because no, no one fit will be suitable for all. Everybody's different. And I think that's really important. And here we are, you know, all being isolated in our homes and, and in, in various situations, we are seeing a landscape right in front of our very eyes as we speak change. And we feel that this landscape will definitely be a different place than what it was three, four weeks ago. So the advice is to feel the moment is to really, really feel the moment. And I would be extremely hesitant to know what advice to give to young people at this point in time, because I know that the whole industry will change once we get out of this situation. Um, and so, you know, here we are as musicians, and I don't know how it is for, for you, but, you know, my whole diary is cancelled, postponed for at least the next four or five months. And I suspect in reality, this could be possibly much longer than that. So what do you do? <laughs> you know what I mean? What do you do? So we're constantly having to redefine, rethink, um, you know, really sort of connect dots to, to think outside of the box um, as to what we do, but not necessarily become totally reactive immediately. Um, because this is a moment where we can really value, you know, what is important in what we do, what can be developed, um, and what things need to be, be changed. So for young people, actually, the landscape is completely and utterly open, and it might be them that, you know, how we move forward, not people like myself who have been in the business a long time. And that's an interesting thing, actually. So we're all using the internet. We can all have websites. We all have our Instagram accounts and other social media accounts. We're all in the same, you know, playing field as, as regards to that. Um, so that's got nothing to do with um, how long you've been in the profession and or anything like that. That is just the tools that we have today. Um, but I think that how we, that I suppose the choices we make are, are so important. So you know, the, the kind of instances, is it important for you to basically accept anything that comes your way? So if you don't want to play in an orchestra, but someone is asking you to play in an orchestra, if it's an amateur orchestra, student orchestra, whatever it is, are you going to say yes or no? And why are you going to make that decision? I can't make that decision for you, but you've got to ask, okay, why will I make whatever decision it might be and what difference will that make you know to the to the big big picture not just for this week not for today but the big picture 
And, and it's things like that. So, for example, in my own case, and bear in mind that we did not have the internet um, when, when I, I left college, um, so it's a completely different landscape, was that, you know, I basically had a very clear idea that I wanted to be a solo percussionist. That was the main long-term aim. So nothing else kind of interfered with that. But what was very important to note was that I had no idea how to achieve that aim. And so therefore, it was a case of me accepting everything. So even if I was playing in, in amateur orchestras, playing next to a 90-year-old and a 10-year-old, it didn't matter. That was an opportunity to play, but it was also an opportunity to introduce myself to the conductor to say that if ever you think of playing a percussion concerto, please let me know. So all the time, everything that I was doing was aiming towards planting seeds as regards to where I wanted to be in the, in the big picture. So this was about planting seeds, meeting people, discovering that conductors had absolutely no idea that percussion concertos even existed in those days. Aha, so now you have an opportunity. So if the conductors didn't know that they existed, then probably audiences didn't either. So, and one thing led to another, commissioning pieces. I had no idea that composers needed to be paid. I thought you would just ask them and they would miraculously play, uh, compose a, a piece of music. Of course they needed to be paid. So what do you do? How, how do you find out about that? So in those days, it was a case of writing letters um, to people who could guide you through this process. So really, a lot of it is not just about your playing. That's only one small portion of what you do. It's really trying to build the bridges and, and trying to get to know your business as a business and see how you can begin to make those links. And it's often doing things that you feel, no, that has no relevance. It has every relevance. So really, you know, grab onto the opportunities and make sure that as part of your development time, just as you spend X amount of time practicing your instrument, spend X amount of time getting to know your business, spend X amount of time making those contacts, spend X amount of time, you know, reading the, the, the music journals, getting to know the vocabulary, the people, the, the, the topics that are being talked about, the challenges, the, the opportunities, all of that kind of thing. Um, that's really important because ultimately it's, it's your journey, it's not someone else's. And it reminds me, I, I, I wish I could answer this question with your own words, because actually many, many episodes ago, we had Elizabeth Galvin, who's a friend of some of ours, on the, on the podcast. And she said she saw Evelyn Glennie play when she was like 12 or something like that. And afterwards, she ran up to Evelyn and said, I want to be just like you. And Evelyn <laughs> said, no, you should be just like you. <laughs> be the best version of you, which I thought was really sweet. Absolutely. And, I mean, at the end of the day, we all, you know, need inspiration. We all, um, you know, feel as though we need, uh, I suppose, role models and all of that kind of thing. Um, and I think for me, growing up on a farm, you know, it was so far removed from uh, what we see today. Um, as regards to, you know, many people coming in, giving master classes, workshops, talks and things like that. There was absolutely none of that, even when I was a full time student. Uh, we just simply didn't have anyone come in to do that. And so, again, it meant that, you know, you had to listen to yourself, your gut reaction. Um, you had to find ways to navigate through certain things and, and not expect that to come from someone else. And of, of course, that's a whole different landscape to how we live today. So, you know, you can, um, in fact, I was sort of going through some of my instruments yesterday and there was a particular shaker type spring instrument that I didn't know the name of. And so all I had to do was type in Remo in this case. And uh, lo and behold, you know, there were several videos of people playing this particular instrument. So not only could I find out the exact name of the instrument, but I could then see this being being demonstrated. Well, of course, you didn't have that, you know, in days gone by. And it meant that you had to think, OK, what is this object? How do I navigate through this? What do I do with it? And so on. And that's not a bad thing either. And I think if we can combine the, the two together where we we think, what is my voice? What, what do I think can be done with this? 
um, then you know we're holding on to that childlike curiosity. And then when we do explore things on the internet, we can really see that as an extension of who we are, um, rather than seeing something, feed it into us, and then think, oh well, uh, now I, I'm not quite sure what I want to do with it, what it feels like, because you're busy copying someone else. So getting that balance is absolutely vital. And I suppose that's a piece of advice I would give to any young player. And it's the piece of advice that I give to myself almost on a on a daily basis. Well, Evelyn, we it's funny you were talking about inspiration because I, I almost don't want to share this because I know we could all go on and on about our Evelyn Glennie inspiration stories. But when I was, I think, 17 in high school in 2004, I actually got to play for you in a master class and it just oh. it absolutely changed my life. Oh. Um, I mean, it's just one of those mind blowing experiences I still carry with me to this day. Um, and you were in Virginia where I was at the time performing and uh, I had been a uh, fan of yours and had your your albums before but there are two names that seem to just historically go way way back and you have a lot of wonderful writings on your website about your you know uh coming through uh, your struggles as a beginning soloist as a female percussionist and you know overcoming deafness that sort of thing but i've never really heard you speak historically about your relationship with uh pianist philip smith and composer john sathis and when John was on the podcast, he talked about way back when, you know, when when his pieces started taking off and he said that, you know, they've seen more of the world than I have, thanks to Evelyn Glynnie. So I was wondering if you could tell us about your longstanding relationship with those two. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Well, uh, I mean, John, I, I, I can't remember exactly when I first met John or, or discovered his music, but I think that it was in those days, in the early days, I made a lot of trips to New Zealand, and it may have been that we, we connected there. And of course, his music is, is so distinctive. Um, it's raw, it's powerful. He has this knack of, um, certainly when he's writing for percussion and piano, of making it a real duo. And the, the, the piano really does become that percussion instrument. Um, and I just simply liked his music. I still like his music. Um, and so I think that we, we found a kind of chemistry there that, that worked in building uh, some of the, the, the repertoire. Um, and of course, you know, in those early days, it was quite hard to find strong pieces for uh, percussion and piano. And most of my recitals in, in those days were with, with my pianist. And um, and so John's pieces really, really, you know, helped us build a program and audiences really did connect with this music. Um, and it seemed to address the, the kind of musical aspect, obviously, um, very percussive. Um, it was visually interesting. The setups were also manageable. So logistically, you know, they um, were all you know, pretty manageable, nothing took up too much space on the stage. Um, it's all really well thought about practically. And uh, and it was just really rewarding to play. So I think that John has always been a favorite composer, if you know, in that sense. Um, as far as my, and, and thankfully, you know, he's continued to, you know, write really strong pieces of music for many different players. And so we've all enjoyed his his repertoire. Um, I, I still remember the, on that concert, I still remember you played his drum dances. Like I just, it's in my mind. <laughs> yep. I love that piece because of the glockenspiel. <laughs> I thought, oh, the poor glockenspiel isn't often, you know, displayed. And there it was next to a drum kit of all things. But um, my pianist, Philip, um, whom I, I still perform with, obviously to a far lesser degree, because um, some of the concerts are without piano. Um, but I've been with Philip, oh, I can't remember, since 1986 or something. And the only reason we came together was because my, the two pianists I happened to use as a student um, were both unavailable for a particular London concert I happened to have. And of course, in those days, it was impossible to find pianists who knew the repertoire because they were basically creating parts from orchestral scores. And so they were developing their own piano parts, as it were, um, or piano reductions. And, uh, and so I was desperately trying to find a pianist who could play this repertoire. And um, this was before the John Sathis days. And so um, a, a friend, or, or actually a past teacher of mine, a, a 
a piano uh, teaching methods teacher from the Royal Academy of Music happened to say, well, I know of an ex-student I used to have, and he's a very good sight reader, and, and so on. I said, Some, this person really does need to be a good sight reader because we've so little time. So anyway, she introduced me to Philip Smith, and uh, he remarkably got the repertoire up so incredibly quickly. Um, he barely said a word. He was a very typical English man, very upright, very thin, like a rod. Um, didn't say anything much in particular and uh, very good mannered and that was about it and at the end of the concert I said well you know what do you think were you happy or, or not happy or do you want to try another concert or whatever and he said well yes yes he would be happy to do that and so you know we're still together and I've been incredibly grateful for everything he has you know, given to me as a musician and given to, to so many audiences along the way. And, and now he speaks a lot more, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is so wonderful to listen to you reflect on your life. And I must say, I've uh, recently finished your new book, Listen World, and I loved it. It's really great for anyone who wants to sort of have a little crash course on, on your life and some current thoughts and philosophies on music and sound and even Shakespeare. I, I really love that there's, um, there's so much that's addressed in the book. Um, but I wanted to ask you about um, your autobiography, Good Vibrations. I remember reading it um, last year and I was in tears so many times because it represents such a fragile part of your life, your growing up and you becoming a soloist. And I was just wondering, could you share a little bit about the process, this reflective process of writing for you and sharing your life story, especially when you were that young, when you wrote that first book? Um, how did that go about? Did you find that uh, to be a challenge or was it easy to put it into words? Can you please tell us? Well, it, it, first of all, with the Listen World book, that really is mainly a collection of bits and pieces rather than a, 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 a kind of book that has a beginning, middle and end. And it's specifically for teenagers. So that's why it's quite sort of bitty in a way. Um, and however, the, the autobiography with vibrations that was written in uh, or leading up to 1989. And so by the time it was published, I was 24 years old. Um, and by no means a natural writer at all. It was just someone, a, a publisher, who asked if I would be interested to put something together. And in those days, I was keeping a daily diary. And so basically, a lot of it was, um, you know, I, I referred back to the diaries, as it were. And, uh, and I was living in a one-bedroom flat in London at the time. I was just a, a, a young musician starting off. And, um, and I had a typewriter in my kitchen and basically I wrote it from the typewriter. So I basically just, I didn't know what to do, how to start a book. I had absolutely no idea. And the, the editor said, just write a word, you know, just even if it's googly gook, it doesn't matter. Just write something, you know, like today I'm sitting at the typewriter, or just anything, or, oh, it's waning outside. Just get used to putting your hands on the keys and just pressing them. And that was that. So bit by bit, you know, I thought, well, where do you start? You start at the beginning, or, you know, or you just write little anecdotes or little memories, or, oh, um, this performance, this is how I felt, da-da-da, that's all. And you build up like that. And, um, and so... I sort of came out with lots of different, you know, aspects, and then I didn't know how to put it all together. And so the publisher very much helped with that. I think my dilemma was that I did not want to talk about deafness, um, because in those days I was so, so eager to be known just simply as a musician and, uh, and not be labeled in any kind of way as a deaf musician or have that at the forefront. So I was very reluctant to talk about that. But of course, the publisher said, well, we, we have to put this in. We have to, to address this. We, you know, we, we've got to discuss this. And so that was something that was not natural to me. I didn't want it to be or to come over as some sort of, uh, you know, any kind of heroic or, or emotional type of journey or anything like that. And I think probably looking back, 
um, you know, now that I've had many years of trying to navigate my way um, in how I deal with my deafness and how I talk about that, um, I think that I can now see how people might read that book and, and think, well, you know, why didn't you talk more about it? Um, but for me, it was very important to be sort of established as a musician, first and foremost, and, and everything else was, was peripheral, really. So, so yeah, and I think that's sort of interesting because that is part of the journey, you know, and, and how you emotionally deal with something. Um, and and I think that's where the internet has really changed things. I remember, you know, having my first website, and that was a, an avenue whereby you could put factual things in, because up to that point, newspapers were looking at other newspaper articles, and so inaccuracies were compounded in a way, whereas with when you've got control over your website, it, it is factual, and that allowed the media to then tap into, um, you know, what, what what's coming from your, your own mouth, you know, direct from you yourself. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it kind of changed, really. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's it's really interesting how you how you speak about that, and um, I remember reading in your book. Um, you sort of mentioned the the frustration. I believe it was particularly when you went abroad and the spotlight uh, all of a sudden being on uh, the profound deafness and not on on the music, which is so much more impactful and powerful. Um, however, I do think that. Um, uh, the world is obviously curious and could learn a lot from from someone like you about how to approach uh, musicians who might have these particular uh, situations or challenges. And I think there's a plethora of wonderful resources on your website. So I just uh, say to anyone who wants to learn about it, either, you know, get the book or go to the website and you're going to learn so much about how to approach this uh, matter in the best way possible. Um I think just to, to to expand that a little, I think it's it's important to also note that you know the whole mechanics of how we understand the body and and use technology um, has just developed you know unbelievably over the years, and of course with something like hearing and deafness, um, you know now youngsters have access to cochlear implants. And it's taken many years for that to be, be developed to where it is now. Um, the fact that you can detect uh, whether a baby is deaf whilst it's still in the womb is extraordinary. And that changes our whole aspect of how we can create support. Um, so it's quite easy for us to box things up and imagine that all hearing impaired people are in that same box and that it's not at all the case. So. Um, you know, it's just the same with, with playing a piece of music. You can line up 10 musicians all playing exactly the same model of a marimba or drum or whatever, but you'll get 10 very different uh, takes on that piece. And hearing is such a complicated thing. Um, and that has nothing to do with listening, by the way. Um, hearing is something that can be measured, but listening, you know, you can have someone who has a very low hearing threshold but their listening skills are extremely magnet magnified and and they can participate in that um so yeah it, it it is a kind of complicated subject absolutely thank you so much um we'd like to maybe take a turn there's a lot of really nerdy percussion questions um on facebook for you so hi <laughs> here we have one from benson kwan saying i always love watching your playing around your office videos where you improvise on your collection of instruments. How do you keep such a wide vocabulary of improvisation? And do you have any tips on how to expand on one's improvisation skills? I am so bad at improvising, he said. Uh, also, how can we learn to improvise with Bjork? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's so funny. It's because I think the challenge in improvising is being aware of time. I don't mean pulse or beat, I mean duration, time as in duration. And that was something I made a very, very big mistake on many, many years ago when I gave my first ever improvised concert. I lost all concept of duration, of time as regards to duration. And basically what felt like two minutes to me was 10 minutes to the audience. And it was a complete and utter disaster 
the whole thing. I had too much stuff on stage. Um, I was too, um, I suppose, uh, wrapped up in myself. And, and I com completely misjudged the audience, their presence, and so on and so forth. So everything that, you know, could go wrong did go wrong in that respect. And it was a massive learning curve. And uh, and so I think that as far as improvisation idea wise is concerned, we are all naturally able to do that. That's what we do every single day of our lives. We improvise as soon as we get up in the morning. We think it's it's kind of structured. It is structured to a sense in the same way that if I walk on stage and there are objects there for me to uh, negotiate, that's a kind of structure as it were. So I know that I am going to venture onto that stage and there might be an audience in front of me. So I'm not going to suddenly make the decision that, ah, actually I'll give the, the concert in the bathroom or something. So there's that kind of structure. Um, but really improvisation is something that you can practice in the same way that you practice maybe a scale or a, a particular phrase from a piece of music. Um, so you can say to yourself, okay, I'm, today I'm going to give myself five minutes on this particular marimba bar just that one bar and see in those five minutes the, the types of ideas, so really observe the types of ideas that you come out with. Within those, those, those five minutes, you might find that two things that last 30 seconds might be the only worthwhile things that you feel, ah, I can actually build on that. Because improvisation is about ebb and flow. It's like going on a motorway and you look out the window and you think, oh, that's nice scenery. And then you go down a bit further and you think, oh, that's a bit boring. And then it becomes nice again. And that's what improvisation is. It, it can't always be on a high. You know, can't, you can't have a climax for an hour if you're improvising. And it's really a, a bit like sight reading. Just do it. You know, just do it, do it, do it. Just for short, you know, you might just say, OK, only a minute now I'm going to spend with this maraca or two minutes I'm now going to spend with this spring drum or whatever it may be. And really getting used to picking things up and just letting you, your imagination go. If nothing happens, you've still not lost anything at all. So improvisation isn't about a win or lose situation. It's about getting used to, to letting your imagination, you know, be used as it were and be free from the written page um, and that's really important so you know when I worked with work it was again a case of two people never having met before we went into the studio she looked at the the various instruments and she said oh what's that up there I would bring it down I just sort of start playing a little something nothing in particular she would then start saying goobly gook over that and, you know, that was that. So we didn't know when we might end, how we might yeah. end, and it didn't matter how that would happen. There's, there's no concern over that at that point in time. So it's just really important that yeah. improvisation yeah. is like yeah. having yeah. complete yeah. and utter yeah. freedom yeah. to scream, yeah. to whisper, yeah. to swear, to be, you know, any way you want with that particular instrument. It's to rip up the rule book as regards to how you negotiate that instrument and just getting used to this freedom that you now have. So just as we're, we're all isolated at the moment, we have the freedom to think, how am I going to use my space? Yeah. You know, not not only time, not only duration, but space. How how right? How am I going to negotiate the space now? It's it's a free field. So although we think we're being more and more enclosed, and oh heavens, this is being taken away, and that's being taken away, and now I can't do this, I can't do that. It's a case of right. What can I do actually? You know, and that then opens up the possibilities unbelievably, and you find extraordinary things that you would never yeah. find in a book, that you would never find from another person, that you know you probably wouldn't necessarily find yeah. yourself um, unless you give yourself yeah, this opportunity. I just wanted to follow that up by saying that when I first started listening to Evelyn, I had albums like Rhythm Song and Light and Darkness. And then one day I bought her album, uh, Shadow Behind the Iron Sun. 
which is, uh, in contrast to those earlier albums, is entirely improvised, and I think inspired by author Michael Crichton, if I remember correctly. But uh, if you have not heard that album, it's definitely worth the listen. It's just, it's so well, cool and so, so different. <laughs> well, the funny thing there was that um, for years I'd wanted to do uh, uh, an improvised recording, and in those days I had a long-term record contract with BMG, and of course, for them to record a percussionist in the first place was, uh, you know, definitely something unusual for them. And uh, and they wanted me to do all um, light music, you know, lollipop music um, to to start with. And I said, well, OK, I might do the first album of that, but then I want to do some some more contemporary things and and. Uh, things that people may not know and they were extremely nervous by that and they said okay we'll let you do one album of sort of unknown things as far as the general public is concerned but we then want to have a light one which was why Danson came about at the same time as Light and Darkness so this was the whole kind of negotiation as it were with with the record company because of course they needed to sell records they needed to sell CDs not just to the percussion family but to a wider field and so they were very conscious of that and then after a few albums um, I said I really want to make a, a totally improvised recording and they said absolutely not no we can't we can't have this and I said look I, I do and trust me on this please just trust me and so they allowed me to to do this but it was only one member of, of the BMG team who really believed that this might be possible so she was the one who was kind of helping me forge this through and uh, because of course we were having to negotiate with the people in New York with BMG in New York and so what happened was that I, I was also quite clear that I wanted a, a more of a pop producer so you know I remember um, you know, making my first album, Rhythm Song. And in the next studio, in, in the London studio, um, there happened to be a pop group in there. And the, the recording engineer who was doing my album, he said, oh, they've been in there for months and uh, they're, they're recording a cowbell thing um, all of this week. And, and you know, and, and I said, well, if they want me to do a cowbell, I'll, do a, I'll just nip in for five minutes and then I'll come back and do my, my thing. And he said, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that. And I said, hold on a second. We've got three days to make an entire recording, you know, making all the arrangements and getting the orchestra to record and all sorts of things of, of all the stuff on rhythm song. And this group has had months in this studio. And you suddenly saw the complete and utter, you know, differences in, in the, the, the arenas that we were dealing with. But going back to the improvised recording, we had asked Michael Crichton because of his production skills. He had never heard of a marimba before. And he, he said, what, you know, what are we going to do? And we met the night before because I happened to be playing in London. He came along to the concert and I said, Michael, this is a marimba. And I said, Michael, this is a whatever type of drum or da da da, whatever. And uh, so we had all of this stuff in a big recording room in in london laid it all out in the in the room together all sorts of objects and he said right what well, you know what are we going to do where are we going to start and i looked at the sim tack which was a, a lorry silencer thing and i said well why don't we just start there and of course for the recording engineer he had not recorded so many of these objects so he said well, what's a, a lorry silencer so uh like play a bit how are we going to mic this up and and so on and so forth by the end of that day, we had to call up BMG in New York and play some of the things down the phone to them so they could see the sort of things or hear the sort of things that we were doing. And this is basically how it went. So we had three days, popped all of this together, and then Michael obviously took the material away to, to edit it. And, and that was how it was all done. And from that, I realized that I would like to to then expand that to live performances. Um, and that's when I had the disastrous performance. And then I met uh, Fred Frith through Touch the Sound. And he then taught me about duration. And I thought, aha, now I see what, what you mean. So, you know, bit by bit, you know, things, things uh, kind of progress like that. But it's definitely a large part of my 
my whole being as a musician. That's so great. That's so great to hear. You know, one of the one of the silver linings of this very strange and challenging time has been. Um, I think we all have the opportunity to slow down and examine the way that we're practicing and why and kind of all the ins and outs. Um, so we have a question from our Facebook listener, Alex Johnstone, and he asks, um, Evelyn, at this point in your career, what does an average practice session look like for you, and is it different from when your career began? Um, yes, that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, when I uh, started playing percussion, the, the academy in London in those days did not have a five octave marimba. They had a four octave marimba, as an example. No solo percussion was dealt with at all, not one iota um, at the academy. It was all orchestral based. Now, obviously, things have changed uh, along the years. So everything was done literally on my own, quite literally. And uh, we only had one percussion room, so a lot of the, the, the practice had to be done in a corridor or in a nearby um, toilet and that kind of thing. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So, of course, you know, your whole practice routine was very, very different then. You were more exam-based, you know, you were, um, you're, you're always aiming towards a particular thing that had to be tested in a way. Um, so everything was sort of structured within an institution. And that's quite different to then being in, in the situation that you find yourself now. I think that, um, and, and obviously in those days, I didn't have my own instruments. And, and even if I did, or as I was building up the collection, I couldn't practice where I lived because of sound pollution and because of space. So even up to the time when I premiered Benny Benny Emanuel, I was living in a one bedroom flat in London and all of the equipment had to be stored in a storage place in another part of London. I then had to hire a practice room every time I wanted to practice. So you would have to hire a van, pick up the instruments from the storage place, get to the rehearsal venue or practice room, set the stuff up, do three hour stints, take it all down, put it in the van, put it back into the storage. So basically for three hours, it would take more or less the whole day. And when I premiered uh, Veni Veni, this is how Veni Veni was practiced, basically. Um, I played the concert and I got back to my dressing room and I simply said, this cannot go on. So I, I knew I could not sustain and have the energy to sustain um, and keep learning pieces of that magnitude, um, you know, on, on a global kind of scale. It was just simply not going to be possible. So I then decided to... Um, leave London and find a property that I could uh, afford um, outside of London and uh, and basically start uh, from that point. It meant that I could have the space to set some equipment up, I could play without annoying anybody and so that then gave me a whole different arena to play with and to develop um, and that's been the case to the present day. What I'm finding um, at the moment as we're all going through the virus situation is, and with everything being cancelled, is that I've, I've completely lost my focus as regards to what I'm doing as a player. So all of the pieces, all of the repertoire that I had geared myself up to perform, really from now, you know, onwards, I don't know if I'll have to play that piece again, you know, when that's going to be... Uh, rescheduled, if at all, and so on. So suddenly the list of pieces become kind of the sort of void. So do you keep them going, you know, almost like spinning tops um, or spinning plates? Do you keep them at a certain level um, or do you just let them go for a while? Um, is this an opportunity to learn new techniques? But then I find myself thinking, and I've always found this with myself, you know, if I'm if I set myself the task of learning a new t technique, well, why am I learning that? For what purpose? How is it going to be used? Is it just for the case of learning a new t technique? Technique. So it's it's a really interesting kind of dilemma, and I found that I haven't opened the studio door for a few days, um, and I'm letting that feeling just happen naturally. Um, so I'm not forcing anything. I'm not sort of you know trying to make something happen. I'm just letting this feeling take its course. And then I know that, right, the time will be right when I think, aha, now I know what I want to focus on or, you know, what I want to take care of. 
and the doors will open again. So, and I think that's okay to feel this sort of void. Um, and I think that that's important anyway, even if you go through periods of your life where you think, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure of where I'm going right now. I'm not sure what I'm really focusing on, why I'm doing this or, you know, we all have those question marks at times and you feel a bit uncomfortable, you might feel a bit sort of anxious about that and, and worried about it. Don't be. This is absolutely natural. It's really, really natural. It's just the ebbs and flows of being creative. And it's fine not to open the doors for a few days of your, your practice area, um, because actually a lot more will be happening than you think it is um, in your mind by just letting that space be there. Um, and, and that's very important to say. So, yeah, I think that uh, for me, it will be a case of really thinking what is important right now um, and just letting things naturally simmer. Um, and, the, and then the focus will become more clear um, as, as the days move on. You know, speaking of that focus, we had a question, another question from Benson Kwan. And I guess I would just say when, when things are at their busiest for you and it's just as crazy as possible, how do you keep, keep a healthy mental state? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very good question as well. I think that um, for me, when I reached the age of uh, 40, I found that I was, that the diary was just so busy it was ridiculous and I found that I was not enjoying what I was doing because there was no time to digest things and uh, and I realized that that it, it was important to find that point within yourself you know what is busy for you and uh, not for someone else but for you and uh, and that's all part of the listening process that goes on and I found that definitely you know, I was going from one place to the other and, and just n nothing was being enjoyed. And so I quite literally took my diary, popped it on the kitchen table and I went through it. And I said, why am I doing that? Why am I doing that? Do I need to do this? What difference is that going to make? And so on and so forth. And I literally weeded things out just as you weed your garden. And it was the best thing I ever did because I suddenly found that I needed time for myself. I needed to understand that no, saying no to something did not equal guilt. So because when I was saying no, I kind of felt, oh, I feel guilty about that. And oh, you know, oh, that's a shame. Oh, you know, they'll think bad of me if I say no and so on. And it was really important to understand the power of saying no. And uh, and it meant that you could then allow bellows into the diary, you know, space into the diary so that you could prepare more, you could think more, you could enjoy the experience more, um, you could enjoy enjoy the occasion more, you could give yourself time to meet people, uh, to connect with people, um, and just things had, had more of a profound effect, I suppose. Otherwise, it was like being on this conveyor belt. So that was an important, important thing for me to do. And, you know, I hope other people can maybe think that if things become a bit sort of ah overwhelming or you're thinking, you know what, I'm not quite enjoying this in, in the same way. It could be such a simple thing like thinking, right, you know, what difference am I making here? So from that moment on, I then realized that whenever an invitation came in, it was always a case of digesting that invitation and thinking, how can I make a difference? And that was it. It's as simple as that. So, you know, your reason might be because, well, you really want to collaborate with someone or you'd never been to a place before or you wanted more experience playing uh, a particular piece or set of pieces or it could be a monetary thing. It could be all sorts of reasons. But as long as you, you were clear on the reasons for accepting or declining a date, then you could sleep at night, basically. So, um, so yeah, that's important. Wow, thanks. It's great. Well, Evelyn, I had a, a question. I love that you, in addition to being such a wonderful musician, you're you're sort of a music philosopher in a sense. Um, and uh, I promise I'll, I'll bring this all back around to make sense eventually. But uh, <laughs> I remember one of my former teachers, Paul Rinnick, talked about when Evelyn came to University of North Texas, she played Michael Doherty's UFO for Kashi Kachirito. 
And he said, Evelyn walks out on the stage and she's wearing this like aluminum foil jumpsuit. I apologize for that. (laughs) And he said she walked out and you just went, what the hell is she wearing? And then Paul's very Philly. And he said, as soon as she finished playing, you went, that's exactly what she should have worn. (laughs) And uh, and I remember years ago, I read an article on your website and it, it troubles me. I can't find it anymore. Um, but you talked about playing at the Disney concert hall and you said you went in and you saw these red gel lights and you said, oh, those would be great for the, you know, the second piece on my program. And they said, oh, oh ma'am, I'm sorry for a classical concert. We don't do the, the colored gels. And they're like, well, but they're, they're right there. <laughs> Can we just use them? No, we don't do that for classical concerts. Well, is there some sort of technical reason? No, we just don't do that. Um, and it, it seems like you have such a good grasp on not only the music itself, but how, how the audience should receive the music. So could you tell us about your, your thoughts on that? And I, I hate to ask you to just sort of rehash that article, but it's, it's so interesting to me how you seem to have mastered not only the playing, but also the presentation of music. Well, that's funny that you should mention that suit. Um, but uh, yes, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I remember... Um, when I was just literally starting out, and EMI um, offered me a, a record contract, and so this was before BMG, and and I was sort of uh, looking at their terms and discussing with them, and I felt really uncomfortable for several reasons. One was that I felt I was just too young to, to have a, a contract, and uh, I just wasn't ready for it. And B, they wanted to sort of doll me up in a way that was so completely unnatural to how I saw myself and how I was. So, you know, short skirts and and low tops and this and that. And I'm afraid that just wasn't me. And uh, so that was a kind of little lesson for me in a way. And then once BMG gave me the, the chance to record, I knew exactly what I wanted to you know how I how I needed to to be as well, and uh, however, um, I also remember when I started playing in Japan in the early years, and because they were seeing me as a classical musician, they imagined all of their female musicians being in nice, lovely long dresses, and I thought, well, I can hardly negotiate John Sappas's music, you know, wearing a great long dress and trying, you know, to to get from one instrument to the other or something. So, and again, this was just simply not me. And so it was really important for me to, to you know, get myself across, not just as a musician, but the whole package, as it were. Um, otherwise, you knew that you would just be sucked into this machine. And I was not a machine, really. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at people's careers, whether it's someone like Björk or... Um, Someone like Kate Bush, you know, I've been very inspired by her and how, you know, an integral part of their journey has been, you know, letting people know exactly where they're coming from, um, not just artistically, but who they are, because ultimately that's the longevity longevity of your career. Um, and, And I think that, you know, with a lot of the pieces, because you are collaborating with the composer so closely, I mean, Michael, he would sometimes buy certain instruments in order to get to know them and and fiddle around with them. Um, He's very much a composer that wants, you know, a lot of communication with the player. And uh, and he's also very dramatic. You know, he's very visual with his music. And um, the sounds are visual. And so, you know, to suggest something like a a space suit or having the tom-toms, you know, that are all silver, you you know, and they're cladding and whatever. This was all the kind of thing that I did in those days, even with Christopher Rice's Der Gerettet at Albrecht, where the soloist is basically Albrecht, a little impish, you know, figure. And, you know, I dress up in, in, in kind of ways that that would suggest, you know, Albrecht scurrying around the, the orchestra, getting up to no good. And um, and I enjoyed that, you know, I really did. I got often very slated for that from the UK reviewers because this was just not something that is very British, to be honest. Um, but, you know, you, you take that and it wasn't going to stop me, you know, from doing that. Um, 
And, you know, if I was playing Chen Yi's percussion concerto that, you know, has so many Chinese elements to it and dance-like elements and so on, um, you, you know, I was thinking about the colours of that red in particular and, and thinking about the flow and the dramaticness, almost like a dragon, you know, of, of that piece of music. And, and uh, so, yes, those were things I definitely thought about. In playing something like Tandon's Water Percussion Concerto, you know, I remember having to do this at the proms. And so I was very careful to think that, well, I needed some kind of material that would not sort of, um, it wouldn't be too obvious for the audience um, if, if that getting wet, you know, to me and, and how that might come through to an audience. And so things like that was, was thought about. Um, and, you know, all of these things have to suit your own journey, that where you're at at that moment. And some of the things I look back on now and I see, you know, myself having worn, I think, oh, my God, what made me do that? You know, but that it just felt right at the time. And that's fine. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's so great to be able to talk to you as one of, I think, all of our inspirations. You're very welcome. It's such a wonderful idea that you're, you're all producing here. I just wanted to say thank you also because I think we're coming to the end of the hour here and you know I saw you when I was a little kid and then I saw you at some point when I was I want to say in high school and I saw you more recently when I was a grad student and just every time I remember each performance so distinctively and when I was really young I was inspired for reasons A, B, C, D and then when I was a little older it was a different set of reasons and then yet another set of reasons and you know you I always think well the more performances you see the the, the more likely it is you won't be re-inspired and it takes more to re-inspire you again but yeah every time I just got well, inspired like just as much as the last time so I don't know we just we owe you so much the, the percussion field. well I mean yeah I, I think that we owe you uh, a great deal of thanks because you know what you are contributing to the percussion world is absolutely extraordinary and and you're oh. you know, giving us so many gems and experiences um and and really truly i i want to say a massive thank you for that because your creativity oh, is second to none and oh and geez no no come on thank so you that's so that's so kind i might just edit that and put it on repeat for <laughs> for another hour no oh, that's great thanks so much that's, that's so kind and i don't deserve that but thank thank you so oh, much carly great. i think you're gonna say thanks <laughs> evelyn i just wanted to say a personal thank you to my here's my my evelyn glenny story is that i got to hear you play ufo concerto um it was the night before my first ever solo recital so it had a huge impact on me it was like the perfect timing, just amazing. Um, and thank you for, for all of your contributions to the percussion community, to the music community, um, to the world and inspirations to us all. Um, I know that you've touched so many more lives than you know, you'll know you probably ever be able to realize, but thank you. And thank you for joining us, of course, but thank, thank you, you for, so for everything that you've done. You're, thank you very, very much indeed. I think what's important to say from my perspective is that you know, speaking with you all and, and so many other people of the younger generation is that you're very much my teachers and I get a lot of inspiration by, you know, what you're doing and how you're all developing things. And it's very important for people, um, you know, who have been in the profession a long time to, to listen to you um, and, you know, to listen to the, the journeys that you're taking um, whether you're behind your instruments or not with the instruments, it's 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 really you know observing the the decisions that are, and the actions that are being made, and again it's looking at that big picture. So allowing ourselves to zoom out is always a good idea, as well as zooming in. But zooming out really is is quite important, which we can do nowadays because of, of social media and the internet. So um, so really for for all of you. I just want to say thank you for, for that, because you are all inspiring me and, and, and what I do. You're welcome. <laughs> and I just want to say, we, we would be remiss if we didn't mention one other one other thank you, and that was Theodore, Theodore Milkov sent a wonderful, I tried to find it really fast, I couldn't find it, but uh, Theodore Milkov, who is one of the greatest firmists in the world, sent a wonderful thing about how he saw you play in Greece at a young age, and it was so inspiring to him. So, thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Good. Oh, well, do stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Know, you. And Thank and I I'm I'm sure we'll get through this this um this challenge that we're all facing together, and we'll we'll be stronger together and more connected, uh, hopefully as well. So, um, but I I do wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dame Glenny, for coming and being our guest and sharing uh, your nuggets of wisdom with us. I too, I've, I've just, I've seen you play in three different countries. I've, I've gotten into a car crash getting to one of the concerts and I made it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just um, not only musically, but just as a human being, thank you for your benevolence and acuity and the passion with which you pursue all that's right. And we, we really, as, as percussionists and as musicians and as people, we couldn't have had a better pioneer or prophet in our field. So thank you so much. My heart is going to explode out of my chest yeah. right now. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. We're all part of the chain. So let's keep that chain together. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. Stay safe so much, and healthy. Take good care. And we'll speak you soon. Too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.